Today we've got a macro photography tutorial for you guys today. It doesn't matter if you're brand new with photography, if you don't have a macro lens, it doesn't matter what kind of camera you shoot with, whether it's Canon, Sony, Nikon, or your experience level, we're gonna get you going shooting pictures just like this really quickly. Now today we're gonna to be focusing on continuous lighting. We're not gonna focus on anything to do with a flash because that can be quite complex. So we're just gonna to stick to what we can control. Whether you have a little LED light like this, or just a lamp, or even a window. Anything where your light is going to be constant and controlled is going to be what we're looking for today. We're gonna to go through a few different scenarios and I'm gonna assume that you have at least some photography experience because we're gonna go through a little bit of the theory and a little bit of the setup and whatnot and some tools to use, but I want you to have at least a little bit of experience when it comes to photography in this case. So we're gonna start off easy as, as though you're a beginner. We'll talk about some tricks and some treats in terms of macro photography. Then we'll move up to something more intermediate and then maybe even some harder stuff as we go. So you don't actually even need a macro lens to start today. You can use an extension tube and these are very inexpensive tools that you can grab for maybe 10 or 20 or $30 online and throw it on any lens essentially making it a macro or a near macro lens. So you can have that or you can have a full dedicated macro lens. It really doesn't matter. The equipment that you're really going to need for this is of course a camera and a lens, preferably a macro lens. A good tripod is gonna be essential and some kind of lighting, any kind of lighting. And the more that you can fine tune that lighting and the different sources, well, the better result that we're gonna have because controlling the light in any aspect of photography is just such a big deal and it's gonna make the most drastic difference. So let's dive right in. I'm gonna be using a few tools to make my life a bit easier in terms of macro, but I do have a lot of gear. Don't worry if you don't have it all. I'm gonna be using a macro rail on my tripod here and this lets me make little fine adjustments so I don't have to be moving my tripod and my camera all awkwardly. So I'd really recommend picking up something like a macro rail if you are thinking about getting into macro photography a little bit more. And of course, with all my gear, I'll throw a link down in the description so you can check it out if need be. Okay, so here is our first setup. All it is is some circuitry and some parts from a computer. And of course, the mundane becomes interesting when you turn to macro photography. We can get in and see it in a completely different way. So all I'm gonna do is look for a few different and interesting compositions uh, in terms of this circuitry here. And we're gonna see it in real time here. This is my setup, my camera on my tripod, which is also on my macro rail to make those fine adjustments so I don't have to move my tripod around. And I have a camera filming here as well to make it easier for you guys to see what's going on uh, behind the scenes in camera. So I hope that helps. And we're gonna use one light to start off with. And in real time here, you can just see the difference that one light makes. And as we move it around here in our uh, image, we can see the difference uh, that it makes. And we're just gonna move that around until we find uh, something that we like the look of. It doesn't have to be crazy to start off with. You don't need to worry about becoming too complex with lighting. So let's just start with that. And another two important things here, I'm going to assume that you're gonna be using a mirrorless camera like me. And with that, we have the ability to use live view on the back. And that means we can see in real time the changes we make to our settings. And that's what our image is gonna look like. Compared to a DSLR, we have to make the settings and change them. And only when you take a photo and look at it, review it, can you see the changes that it's made. So I'm gonna assume that you have a mirrorless camera as well like me. Make sure live view is turned on so you can see what's going on in real time. And if you have it, turn on focus peaking. And this is gonna allow you to see exactly what's in focus. And this is really important in terms of macro photography because we are typically dealing with a very, very shallow depth of field. Now, it can be representative of a color, blue, green, white, it doesn't matter. You can probably choose it in your camera. For me, it's gonna be red. That's just the color that I chose. So make sure focus peaking is turned on so you can actually see what you're dealing with. You also wanna be in manual focus for the best experience. Even if you have an autofocus lens, let's just throw it into manual focus to have some precision this time because ultimately you're gonna have way better results down the road using your macro lenses and macro photography in general in manual focus. So let's have a look here and see what we're dealing with. Again, as we move our light around, we can see how it impacts our composition and our subject. So let's just take a photo right there. Let's see where our focus is. We can see that with our focus peaking. And if I move it forward or backwards, you're gonna see that focus move just a little bit. So I want that right in the center of our frame there. 
I'm going to adjust my settings here because we have it on a tripod. I have the luxury of keeping my ISO down to 100 and we can set our shutter speed at whatever we want. So I'm gonna throw my ISO down to 100 here for the best quality picture. And obviously that's underexposed now. So I'm gonna actually move my uh, shutter speed down uh, and we can do that comfortably because it's gonna be on a tripod and we don't have camera shake. Now aperture is gonna determine how much of our subject is in focus. When we have a very wide aperture like f1.4 or f2.8, we're gonna have a very small and shallow depth of field. But as we stop down to maybe f8 or f11 or f16, we're gonna get more of what we want in focus. However, when we stop down too far, we're gonna to start to sacrifice image quality through something called diffraction. So typically in most lenses, you don't wanna go past about F16, but in this case, we're just gonna show you what the difference is. So let's go ahead and compensate here for our exposure. I'm gonna put it down to my fastest aperture, which is F2.8. I'm going to level out my exposure with my shutter speed there. We've got 1 25th of a second, F2.8 and ISO 100, and that, my camera is telling me, is perfectly exposed. So another thing you wanna do, so we don't want any camera shake because that's gonna obviously take away our sharpness right away. We wanna turn on a timer on our camera so that we can basically hit that timer, let the camera and the tripod settle, and then take the photo without any motion blur at all. So in my case, I have it set to five seconds here. I'm gonna see exactly where it's in focus because I have focus peaking turned on, and I'm gonna take my photo. We'll wait five seconds and it's going to take our exposure. And there you have it. That's what our photo looks like at f2.8. I'm gonna stop down to show you the differences without making any other adjustments other than compensating for my exposure. Let's go down to f8 and that means we have to move our shutter speed to compensate for our exposure down to about there. And if you do see those zebras there, that means that that is an overexposed area. That's another option that you can play around with if you wanna see what's over or underexposed. But that little plus or minus 0, 0.0 there is gonna tell me on my camera that it's perfectly exposed. So let's go ahead and take another photo. Now our shutter speed is 0 0.4 seconds and we're gonna wait our five seconds and see the difference between f2.8 and f8. There we go, and that's what F8 looks like. As you can see, there's a lot more in focus. And let's stop down way down to, let's go all the way down to F22, which is our minimum aperture. Now we're really gonna have to compensate to uh, get that perfect exposure. Now it's gonna be a four second exposure. I'm gonna go down one, one third of a stop more just because it looked like we were overexposed a little bit. And we're gonna take a photo once again here at F22. And that's exactly why we use a tripod, so we can use longer exposures to keep our ISO down. And that's what it's really gonna to take to get some great macro photos. And we will talk about stacking photos later, which is a completely different animal. But in this case, let's have a look at the three different exposures that we took, F2.8, F8, and F22 to show you the difference. So hopefully that gives you an idea about how aperture is gonna make a big difference in terms of your overall photo and how much is in focus. So I'm gonna actually stop back down to, let's say about F13 here, and let's find a new composition. Let's move our lighting around a little bit to find something a little bit more interesting. But this time I'm gonna throw a background in. I'm gonna use a paper right here, a colored piece of paper, and you can use construction paper or anything really. And I'm gonna throw that in the bottom here to give us just a little bit more uh, impact of our photo. So, and I'm also gonna adjust it a little bit so that it's, uh, just a little bit unique, a little bit different, and maybe we can start to get a few different layers of that circuitry. So we can play around with, with, uh, with our angles and whatnot, and that looks pretty good to me. So let's go ahead and check our settings here. It looks like we're overexposed, so we're going to adjust our shutter speed. Uh, F13 looks pretty good for me, and ISO 100 is great. So let's uh, go ahead and, um, yeah, let's go ahead and take that photo and see what we're looking at. I'm gonna adjust my focus just a little bit backwards. And we've got our five second timer. And let's go ahead and take that photo. And there you have it at F13. Okay, let's get another light involved here. Let's turn on this big guy and we'll use the colored light this time. Let's try and get some kind of ambient light going, just kind of something different. 
and we can choose in this particular light what color we want. So right now we've got a blue one, but I think kind of uh, maybe a red or an orange would look kind of cool in this case. We want to go ahead and make our hue different. And why not something like that? Something crazy and pink, orangey. And that's gonna look pretty cool with the blues and the greens here, I think. So let's take a, another photo of the exact same thing. We're gonna move this back a little bit um, and uh, see the difference that lighting makes with the exact same settings. So I think that's pretty cool. But this time I wanna separate the foreground and the background a little bit to really draw my attention to my subject, which in this case is gonna be that middle piece of circuitry. So I'm going to take my aperture all the way down here to let's say F4, and I'm going to adjust my shutter speed. And we're gonna make sure that that right in the middle there is what I want to have in focus here, right where it says the brand. And let's go ahead and take that photo. Now it's a much faster shutter speed at 1 13th of a second. Let's go ahead. So this just shows that you don't always have to have everything in focus. Sometimes that's not what we want out of the image. So in this case, I think that's kind of neat to have kind of some layers to it to isolate maybe just the middle and have the foreground and the background a little bit blurry. I kind of like it. So that's our first one. Now, why don't we move on to something a little bit more complex, more complicated and see if we can get more creative. All right, so now we're at our second setup here, a little bit more uh, intermediate, maybe a little bit more challenging. We're gonna focus more on our subject and maybe getting a bit more of an interesting background and definitely play around with the lighting a bit more. So this time my subject is gonna be this cool shell here, uh, nice and reflective, a lot of depth to it and obviously some cool, um, almost fractal-like properties. Um, now, I'm gonna use some Play-Doh to actually prop that up here, although you can use, uh, you know, get creative with it if you have any clamps or anything like that. But this is gonna be just fine for my needs. Instead of just your typical one light setup here, I'm gonna get a bit more complex here and I'm going to use something called an Adaptalux Studio setup, which actually lets me take a bunch of little arms here um, and control the light from, from several different angles, which is really cool. So you might not have access to this and that's fine. You can use a, a lamp and if you wanna get creative, put maybe a, a blue or a red or any colored film over it to uh, kind of generate a different kind of color. But we're just gonna play around and see what we get out of these. So let's, uh, let's leave that for now. We're gonna, we're gonna set this up. I'm gonna grab my Play-Doh and I'm just going to arrange this here um, so that uh, the Play-Doh is kind of out of the way. Um, and I want, just wanna have it kind of propped up. So let's, uh, let's do that here. We've got our setup here, our camera more um, kind of straight head on. And I'll explain why in just a little bit, a little bit of the differences. So let's look at our camera here, our setup. And what we're gonna do is just find our subject here and find our composition a little bit. And now I do have it on right now, I have it on autofocus so I can just uh, just kind of dial it in. And then I'm gonna switch over to manual focus uh, to, uh, to see where our focus is at and everything. So there, there's what we're looking at right there. Um, looks pretty cool, um, really interesting shell. And as you can see, it's quite dark. Now, one tip for you, obviously in this room, I have a lot of lighting going on and that's not really controllable in this case. But if I was doing this uh, by myself, I would start with a darker environment and I would just add one light at a time to see what I like and what I don't like. So starting from a darker environment is, is for me always the best because you can, you can add light, um, but you can't take away light. So it's just easiest that way. So let's have a look at our composition here. And what I thought I'd do in my mind is uh, kind of work with the shell and also uh, use the background um, in, a, in an interesting way. So I'm going to kind of set my composition up here, maybe raise it up just a tiny bit. And I want that, uh, that little bit of um, spiral kind of in the corner. I don't want to see any of that Play-Doh, of course. But I do want to see, um, I do want to see that spiral. So I'm going to try and utilize the rule of thirds here somewhat, and I'm not going to be able to fully just because I don't want that Play-Doh getting in there. So as long as I have that spiral in the frame, I think I'm going to be, I'm going to be happy. So at this point, I'm going to switch over to manual focus, and what we're going to have to do is make sure we are at the right distance. So I'm going to adjust 
or I could move my subject because it's easier now. Uh, just a little bit of um, playing with it to get it exactly where I want it. So we're looking at about one to one. And it's okay if you don't want to use exactly one to one sometimes. You can always crop in later. There's no rules to say it has to be exactly macro one to one ratio. Uh, there's no rules at all. That's why it's fun. So let's get in here and see what kind of we're looking at here. There we can start to see some of our focus peaking. And yeah, in this case, I think I might want to actually just back off a little bit and maybe not go quite one to one. And I can do that on this lens by looking at the ratios that are uh, available to me. And in this case, it looks like it's at about one to 1.2. So very close to macro still. Uh, but what that's doing is giving me some um, bit more of the background area, which I'll explain why in a second here. So I'm going to play with my macro rail. I'm going to adjust it to see where my focus is. And I'm at f2.8 at this moment. So I want to close down the aperture a bit. I want to get more of the shell in focus. So we're going to stop down again to probably about, let's say about f11 or so, uh, f13. Let's try that. We're at ISO 100. And to properly expose, we're going to need about, uh, about a 1.3 second exposure. Uh, so there we go. That's what kind of what we're looking at right now. And for me, this just really isn't that exciting. So again, imagine that this light isn't here. I have probably one light, like a little LED here. But in this case, I'm going to utilize my Adapt Deluxe setup here. And I can just throw this arm in and it's gonna turn on automatically. And I'm gonna utilize one of this uh, white light to get some color on our shell here. And right away, that's starting to look really cool. So I'm gonna adjust my exposure based on the new light. And that is a pretty cool looking shell all uh, with all of its luminescence and, and whatnot. But I'm also gonna add in a bit of color too. We've got a blue light here uh, and that's kind of neat. So I've got this kind of vision of a very kind of psychedelic, and I have a red one too. So why not use our blue and our red light? Um, throw that on there, and we can adjust that as we want. I think I want the, the blue and the white just on the edges, um, and the, the white light as my main light out in front. So looking in camera, that's definitely too much red for me, and the whole thing just looks overexposed. So I'm going to go ahead and see if I can properly expose it. And that does look pretty cool, but I want to uh, get a little bit less red. I want just a tiny hint of red on the top. And same thing with the blue. I just want to maybe move the blue over a little bit and have the white light as still my main source. That looks kind of neat right there, but definitely an element that's missing is the background. So let's, why don't we grab uh, one of these pieces of paper here and throw that in real time and see what difference it makes. And right there, even with the reflection of the blue light looks pretty neat. We can see a major difference. So it's a bit dark though. So we have two options here on this one. We can um, use both sides of our paper and uh, kind of mess with that and see what that looks like. We can move it around. That looks pretty neat. Again, a little bit heavy on the red here. So I'm just gonna take a let that away just a little bit. So instead of this, I have uh, another trick up my sleeve here. I'm going to introduce some string lights, some little fairy lights that I have kicking around to get just more of a dynamic background. Okay, so here are my fairy lights, my string lights, and all I'm going to do is just place them in the back here and just see what it looks like in camera and see how that makes our, our background look. As you can see, as I move it around here, uh, it doesn't look super amazing and mainly because we're stopped down to about f13. So if we do uh, widen our aperture, you can see that those balls, that bokeh is gonna get much more pronounced, much, much blurrier and much nicer looking. So as our aperture becomes wider, the diaphragm is gonna be more circular and that's gonna give us a more pleasing look. But the problem with that is if we want the pleasing look of the bokeh, we're gonna lose our shallow depth of field. So it has to be a compromise, doesn't it? Well, not entirely. I'm gonna show you a little trick here. First, we're gonna take care of the background, and then I'm gonna show you how to basically combine the best of both worlds. So let's go down here to uh, f2.8, which is my widest aperture, and we're gonna compensate again, and let's have a look at that. So for me, that's just really neat. That just gives it a very, uh, really cool look. 
uh, just a dynamic look in the background. So let's uh, let's go ahead and take our first shot here at f2.8 with the background. In fact, I want that background to be a little bit lighter. So I'm going to actually overexpose the front a little bit and I'll explain why in a little bit. So let's just take that photo here. Our timer is on so that we don't get any camera shake. And that's what that looks like. But as you can see in our photo here, we don't have a ton of our shell in focus. So now I'm going to actually stop down quite a bit here. Uh, let's say about, uh, let's go down to F11 again. And we're gonna adjust our uh, shutter speed here accordingly so that everything is in focus and there's not too much overexposed. So let's go ahead and take that photo right there. So now we've got a still pretty interesting background, but not quite as extravagant with that bokeh at f2.8. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take both of those photos and we're gonna combine them in post in Photoshop because you can't have all of the best of all worlds. You can't do it in a single exposure. So I'm gonna show you how we can easily and quickly take both of those elements and put them together. Okay, so here we are in Photoshop and I'm gonna show you really quickly how to basically merge two photos together. We want the nice background here of our F2.8 photo, but we want the sharpness of our F8 here. We want to have all that depth of field in our photo with the other background. So what I'm gonna do is just grab this background here. I'm gonna click and drag it up to our other photo. I'm going to drop it right in the middle. I'm gonna press Control T to make sure that's nice and aligned properly. And those two layers right here are just basically one on top of the other. Our F8 here is on top. And if we take away the visibility, we can see that underneath is the F2.8. So in this case, all we're gonna do is grab a layer here and go to our brush tool. We're gonna to make sure it's on black and we're just going to basically paint in our background, basically revealing the photo below. And it's really that simple, guys. All we're doing here is just basically revealing the photo behind. And this is basically how you photo stack. You just take a bunch of photos and you, you paint in what you want to be revealed and what you don't want to be revealed is, is fine too. So in this case, all we're doing is just grabbing the background here um, and, and just kind of painting it in. And I think that background just looks a lot better, just more unique and, and it's just more pleasing to the eye. Now I could definitely clean that up a little bit, but for time's sake, I'm just gonna leave it. I don't like that big glob there, so I'm gonna use my spot healing brush and just kind of paint this out. But make sure you're not on your layer here. You gotta be on your photo here, the original, and we're just going to get rid of this so it kind of blends in nicely. And let's have a quick look at that um, when it's done. And that's really kind of what I was looking for. We've got the nice background of the f2.8 and we have the sharpness here of our f8 photo. And it's as simple as that guys to blend two photos together. I hope this helped. Okay, we're back with the shell and this time I wanted to do a different composition with it leaning a little bit more, trying to get a bit more depth out of the photo and just utilize a bit more of the red and the blue here. Uh, we're gonna still use this, but I'm gonna try and get everything in one shot and find like a compromise between that nice bokeh in the background and getting enough of our subject in focus. So a cool thing that you can do here is just screw in and out of our little lights here on our Adaptalux setup. And that's gonna basically give us a bit more uh, flooded look or a fine, uh, more of a concentrated light. And I can also throw on a few of these little diffusers here and uh, just kind of play around with how much light is actually reaching our subject. So we're gonna look here in camera and wow, that looks really neat right there with the blue and a little bit of red. I think I might just add a tiny bit more red, just a, just a hint. And we've even got some rainbow uh, luminescence from the natural shine of the shell, which looks really cool. And then I'm just gonna play with the background here to see um, what, uh, what I like. So that's kind of neat. I just wish there was a little bit more of our uh, lights there we go, so if I kind of just hold it there, I can kind of force a few more uh, into the frame. Nothing too crazy. And we're at F8 here. And this time I'm on autofocus, just to find help find my subject a little bit easier. And I want to just adjust where I want my focus to be in autofocus this time. And I'm gonna choose right in the middle here. 
So let's go ahead and take that exposure and see what it looks like. So that's really cool for me. Uh, I think that's a really nice compromise between that bokeh in the f2.8 and having, of course, everything in focus. Uh, that's a nice compromise at f8 here for me. And in our next setup, we're going to go into detail on how to get every single thing in focus at higher magnifications. So it gets really tedious, really frustrating, and also really rewarding. So I hope you like this intermediate setup. And of course, drop all your questions and your comments down below. And here's an example of one of the photos that we've taken here today. And over here is my preset master pack that I've recently come out with. And just to show you how in one click, the drastic difference that you can make to your photos, a really great baseline for just being creative to start at somewhere. And I've put together these over the years and really fine tune them so that they're all unique and they're, they're different enough that you can get a really cool look. So if you really don't know what you're looking for, if you don't have a ton of editing experience, well, don't worry, just go down the list and see something you like and you can put your own spin on it from there. But here's just an example of what you can expect out of that master pack. And guys, if you did wanna pick it up, check the link in the description for a special offer. Okay, so this is our third and final setup. This is gonna be the most complex, the most frustrating, and definitely the most time consuming one. We're gonna be doing some photo stacking with an incredibly high magnification lens. This is a two and a half to five times magnification, completely manual. It has a very fixed working distance. This is definitely by far the most frustrating and the most tediously annoying lens that I own, hands down, and I love it. So a quick tip for you, just because you can use more magnification doesn't mean that you should. It's going to complicate your life immensely and it's going to make finding nice, pleasing compositions much, much harder. It's a lot harder to actually get in there when you see tiny little things and, and figure out how they're gonna look good. Lighting is also a huge deal because this lens needs a ton of light, especially out at five times magnification. So let's see exactly what that looks like. Let's throw some light on our subject here on the flower and let's just light this up. So right here at 100 ISO, it looks like we're going to need an approximate exposure time of about six seconds. So that's with uh, quite a bit of light hitting that not diffused at all. And when you're getting into these high magnification scenarios, it's a lot harder to get pleasing looking light. It's a lot harder to diffuse things because you need so much light to expose properly. So this is exactly what two and a half times magnification looks like on this flower. As you can see, it's just a bunch of craziness here. And our depth of field, even at F11 here, is incredibly, incredibly small, incredibly shallow. So that's why we're gonna have to start to focus stack in this case. So let's see just for fun what five times magnification looks like on this plant here. And here's what five times magnification looks like. As you can see, you can barely even see what you're working with. And the depth of field now is so shallow. We're talking about fractions of a millimeter. It's just crazy. At 100 ISO here, it's gonna take 10 seconds for an exposure. Let's just take a shot for fun. Let's try and see if our camera will give us a little bit of focus peaking. And it's really hard because it's so, so, so small. Let's take a shot. And I'll skip you the 10 seconds, but definitely have your timer on. So there you go. You decide if that's interesting enough to actually set up and go through the process of shooting in five times magnification. We can also throw this into crop mode to get seven and a half times, but we're just talking crazy now. So let's get back to reality. We'll head down to two and a half times magnification, and we're gonna set up our bee here on our flower. And yes, this is a bee that's passed away on us, and we're gonna use it as a subject to try and get a cool focus stacking picture. Okay, so here we have our bee position on our flower. I recommend if you're using insects or working with tiny things, maybe get yourself a pair of scissors that works really well. And I've got this guy just right at the edge here, um, just look, kind of looking like he's getting after some pollen or something. And of course there is no replacement for real insects or live things, but it's just about impossible to get them exactly how you want them. It's, it's just pure luck. 
And if you did want to see a flash video of us getting out there into nature and, and doing some flash photography with macro, well, just let me know down in the comments. So in this case, we were going to set up our composition as nicely as we can here at two and a half times magnification. We're going to start way back on one side here. So right before anything is really in focus, and now we're stopped down to F16, just so we don't have to take as many photos. Just to give you an idea about how many photos we're going to have to take, let's take a few and see where it goes, and I'll spare you the rest of them before we go and put it all together. So I'm gonna start in the very right-hand corner there, and I wanna get just the very, very farthest point in focus, and then we're gonna slowly work our way towards the B. And as you can see here, it's so hard to get everything in focus and you really have to kind of visualize where it's going to end up. Because if I go forward like this, you see, well, right there, I've actually hit the table. So I would have to stop at that point. So it's a good thing that I took notice of that. Maybe check your whole range of motion. So what we're gonna be doing here is actually just moving our macro rail a little bit at a time uh, just to see um, that tiny, tiny little bit of focus move back just ever so slightly. So there we go. Let's, let's test our range of motion here about as far as we wanna go. And you can ask yourself, where do you want the focus to stop? So right here, that looks pretty good to me. That's about the end of the B. Now you can start at the far end or you can start at the close end. It doesn't really matter. So let's go ahead and uh, just for the sake of time here, I'm going to up the ISO just a little bit. I'm not too concerned with image quality um, because at right now our exposures are going to take 20 seconds. And remember, with any camera movement, that's going to ruin our shot. And if we miss even one of these shots in succession, well, our whole image could be ruined. So let's start at the back there. You can see that the, the whole back of our, our B is in focus there, a tiny little bit. We have a 10 second exposure. Um, it will make that a little bit faster at eight. We do have a few things um, overexposed, but I'm not too concerned with the background. We'll go there six seconds and take our first shot. So you're basically holding your breath for six seconds, and then I'm gonna take my macro rail here, or if you have your lens and camera on a tripod, you're just gonna move it back ever so slightly, or if you can maybe put your subject on a piece of paper, you could move that piece of paper ever so slightly to take another photo. But luckily I have my macro rail. So what I'm gonna do here is just move it back a tiny, tiny pinch, just about probably less than a millimeter. And I'm gonna take another shot. Let my timer go, hold my breath. And there's shot two. So I'm gonna jump ahead here. I'll show you uh, kind of sped up me doing these photos and then we'll head over to the computer. So if you're thinking about getting into macro more seriously and you are going to be doing photo stacking, then having a macro rail is an absolute must. It's going to save you a ton of headache. It's really the only way to go in terms of accuracy for photo stacking. And I also wanted to show you a comparison between two photos, one shot here at f2.8 and one at a minimum aperture of my lens at f16. As you can see, a huge difference in terms of the area in focus. And do be aware, although I think there's a little bit of camera shake in the F16 here, that as you stop down, you will sacrifice image quality. So at F16, it's going to be nowhere as sharp as, say, shooting around F2.8 or F4 or even F8. Okay guys, so here's the process of photo stacking here. We're going to use Lightroom and Photoshop. We're going to start in Lightroom here and we're gonna have a look at our sequence of photos. And you might've noticed that all of these dirty looking things here, this is gonna happen often in macro photography. This is basically just lens and definitely sensor dust, and it's exaggerated when you're using macro lenses and definitely when you're stopped down. So that's something that you're gonna have to deal with at some point. So do your best to keep your lenses and your sensors clean to avoid this type of thing, but it's really inevitable. There's gonna be some cleanup to do. That's why macro photography is just so tedious because there's always more to do. So I wanted to show you this here, and this is a great example of why nothing's ever perfect. And sometimes photos just don't work out. So let's go through the sequence here. We started our focus on the back of our B, 
And as we took it, we can see that our focus is getting just a little bit, uh, a little bit towards the front more and more, just a couple millimeters at a time. But I kind of messed up here, it looks like. I kind of went off the rails here. You can see that the perspective, look at that. It's not good at all. The perspective of the B completely changes. So my composition has been horribly flawed, even worse. I didn't have my, my tripod dialed in here with my macro rail. Maybe I was rushing a bit. And so this, this really isn't going to work. As you can see, the front of the B is just nowhere where we want it to be. And I've gone past the point of focus here. This is, so this is too far forward. So that one's not gonna be usable. So this is a really good lesson that not always is it gonna work out for you. And if I were to Photoshop these ones, uh, we'd kind of lose three quarters of the image here because it's the, where we want in focus, the eyes and whatnot, it's just not gonna be in focus. So luckily I've got a backup here. I have a si more simple one. And this is a sideways taken of the B and it's a bit easier to do when you're dealing with less length. Because of we're dealing with such a shallow depth of field, as you know, um, I just took five images here and we're gonna just go ahead and do this one because it's, it's less of a focal plane, so it's gonna be a bit easier. So just to show you again, it's not always perfect, it doesn't always work out, but this one might be kind of interesting. As you go through here, you can see uh, we've got different parts of the image in focus and we're definitely gonna use this one because it worked out a lot better. So what I'm gonna do is we need to bring these five images into Photoshop. I'm gonna highlight all of them, holding shift there. I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna to go to edit in Photoshop, but I want to go as open as layers in Photoshop. That's important, not just open in Photoshop. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so here we are in Photoshop and you can see that it's brought in all of our photos here and made them layers. So they're one on top of each other. And now we want to let Photoshop do some of the heavy lifting and auto align those layers. All we have to do with them selected is head up to edit and go down to auto align layers here. We're gonna click on that. We're gonna use auto in this case, but you can play around to see what looks best for you. And we're gonna hit okay. So there it's auto aligned the layers for us. You can just take its word for it because we can't see exactly what it's done yet. And there's just one more step. So now what we're gonna do is go up to edit again. And this time we're gonna go down to auto blend layers. And what this is gonna do is find basically where it's in focus and it's gonna stack our images for us. We wanna make sure that stacked images is selected here. And obviously content fill is always a great thing in terms of Photoshop and does a relatively good job. So we're gonna hit okay. So what it's doing is basically aligning everything for us. It's basically the auto version of what I showed you earlier. So instead of going in and tediously using your layers and revealing certain ones, well, this is gonna do it for us. So there you go, it's gone ahead and merged all of our photos for us down here. You can actually see that it's created masks and with the different layers, it's done all the heavy lifting and masked out the areas to make everything sharp. And it's really as simple as that. And now we can begin the tedious process of going in and fixing all of our sensor dust and whatnot and doing all of our editing. So this is really just a baseline. But as you can see here, I don't have the entire B in focus. And sometimes you don't wanna have everything in focus. Uh, and this is a perfect example of that. On the back here, it looks kind of cool having a little bit of blur as well as on the front. So it all depends on what you're looking for but definitely always shoot more than you think you need. And then if need be, you can leave out certain frames or certain parts of your image that you don't actually want to be sharp. So we can go up to file here, we can go to save, and that should create a file back in our Lightroom catalog. So if we go over to our Lightroom here, hopefully it's created a stacked version and absolutely, yes it has right here. So again, from here, now we can go and start to make our edits, our cleanup and everything like that, but it's really as simple as that. You can do this with Photoshop, although it might seem a bit intimidating. I just showed you a really simplified version how to do it, but there's also programs that make it even easier, like uh, Helicon Focus, for example, which I do play around with quite often, and uh, a whole bunch of other programs these days. I hope that helped you out. And here's a look at the finished product. This photo that I've done after some edits and cleanup. And here is the before and the after. Let me know what you think about this, guys. I really hoped you liked this video and found it helpful. If you did, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button. Join the community and make sure you drop all your questions and your comments, your feedback down below, guys. Thanks so much for watching the video. Like always, make mistakes, be yourself, 
and get out there and take some more pictures. See you next time.